Good evening, everybody. Welcome to the National Press Club. I'm Jan King. I'm on the Book and Author Committee. And tonight we are so honored to have Jessica Buchanan discussing her harrowing saga of captivity in Somalia as told in her book, Impossible Odds, The Kidnapping of Jessica Buchanan and Her Dramatic Rescue by SEAL Team Six. It was written by Jessica and her husband, Eric Landeman, with Anthony Flacco. And here's the big news. We just found out it hit the New York Times bestseller list today. So that's so exciting to have a New York Times bestseller person right here. And the book will be for, uh, for sale outside. And all the proceeds go to benefit our press club library. And Jessica will be signing copies here right after our question and answer period. Before we begin, a couple things. Silence your cell phones, OK? And I want to mention a few of the upcoming events at the National Press Club. On June 4th, we're going to have Walter Cronkite the 4th and Maurice Iserman. And they're going to discuss their book, Cronkite's War. On June 19th, we're going to have author Steve Barry. He will discuss his book, The King's Deception. And on June 27th, a real treat, we have John Hendricks, who is the founder and chairman of Discovery Communications. And he will be having a conversation with Paul Lazan. So that's on June 27th. So back to Jessica over here. Jessica had trained as a teacher. And she had chosen to work in the humanitarian field for a non-governmental organization in Somalia. She was returning from a training session in southern Somali to her home in the north on October 25, 2011, when all hell broke loose. In a brief and ferocious attack, she and her colleague were snatched off the roadway by a group of AK-47 toting gunmen. There was no provocation for the attack, and Jessica's work teaching children and instructing locals on how to avoid landmines was non-political and non-religious. It was clear that Somalia's pirates had graduated from seizing merchant ships to seizing innocent people on land. Moreover, they were willing to capture American civilians even those in their country peacefully working on behalf of the local population. Not surprisingly, the percentage of survivors in such cases was very low. With Jessica and her colleagues surrounded by dozens of heavily armed men, the odds of rescue attempt were all but impossible. They were held outdoors in filthy conditions and kept on a starvation diet, and her health steadily deteriorated. Ransom negotiations dragged on, and as the ordeal stretched into the third month, the captors grew increasingly impatient. They were looking for a payoff as high as $45 million and threatened that if they didn't get it, they planned on selling the two captors to an Islamic group. So there was a lot of terror going on, but as you can see, Jessica looks gorgeous. She looks beautiful, and she survived. And she's going to be here to tell you in her own words about her story. So let me present Jessica Buchanan. Well, after hearing all of that again, it's amazing to be sitting here with all of you. So I just want to say thank you so much for coming out and um, joining us tonight. And um, the first question that everybody always asks is, what brought you to Africa in the first place? And um, I think the thing that drew me to Africa um, in the beginning was that I just um, was raised in a family where we were um, taught that we needed to help. And so it didn't matter if you were helping your neighbor or you were helping children in, in Africa or, you know, in Central America, wherever. And so you took the opportunities that came to you and, and you did what you could. And I was in college when 
I um, learned about this whole child soldier phenomenon, um, these African children um, in Uganda, South Sudan, being taken from their homes, taken from their families, kidnapped, and then forced to fight in these militia groups. And something about it just really struck a chord with me, and I started becoming just it, it was, I felt insatiable about trying to get all the information that I possibly could about this whole phenomenon going on. And so, um, through a series of events, I ended up traveling for the first time in 2006 to um, South Sudan to do some volunteer work with recovered child soldiers in an orphanage. Um, that didn't go very well. And so, I ended up being evacuated and traveling around East Africa and um, coming back to the States, graduating college, um, and I was offered a job in Nairobi, Kenya uh, to teach at an international school. And although it wasn't exactly what I was um, hoping to do, it was a, 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 a door that was open and I took the opportunity. So um, it was in 2007 uh, that I went to Kenya to teach and then that's where I met my husband, Eric. Um, a, I met this Swedish guy who uh, <laughs> um, was a, a working in, in Kenya, but also in Somalia and Zimbabwe. Um, he was a, is a human rights lawyer and uh, was doing some really interesting work. And I never really thought about Somalia, what was going on there. Didn't know a whole lot about it until I actually met him. Um, and then in 2009, we married and I moved up to Somalia to be with my husband not exactly the most common place that a bride goes to be with her husband, but that's where I ended up. And it was there that I um, actually started out working for a Danish organization uh, that was dealing in armed violence reduction and mine risk education for children and communities in Somalia. Um, there Somalia and Somaliland in the north where we uh, were living is post-conflict. Um, well, the North is post-conflict, and so they have a lot of war munitions left over from their civil war, and so they have organizations going in, clearing out the landmines and the explosives, but they also have problems with armed violence. Um, you know, a lot of people who don't know how to manage their conflicts, and so, and a lot of weapon-toting individuals, and so that's what I was doing um, on October 25th. Uh, 2011, I had gone down into the south um, on a field mission um, to go in and actually just train some of my staff. I was the education advisor at the time and um, basically just making sure that they had all the materials they needed, that they were doing what they needed to be doing as they went out into communities in Somalia to teach about mine risk education and armed violence reduction. Um, what I uh, didn't realize at the time, even though I felt that maybe something was, wasn't right, some, I, I didn't feel necessarily very safe going into an area um, such as Galkayo, um, but uh, I ignored my instincts and um, didn't know at the time that there was actually a direct kidnapping threat um, for the organization and for the expats that were working in the organization. Um, ironically enough, uh, I think my subconscious was kind of telling me that something was going on. The night before, um, on October 24th, I sent Eric a text message and said, um, if I'm kidnapped, will you come and rescue me? And he was working four hours north in the middle of Somalia doing some trainings and he said, um, you know, ah, make sure nothing happens you know, get back here safely, uh, you'll be fine, uh, something like that. And um, I have to say that when the initial abduction hap happened, that's all I could think about was that text message that I had sent my husband, <laughs> the irony. Um, so October 25th, I leave the North office. Um, we cross the Green Line, which is an area in this particular part of Somalia that's supposed to be um, safe, you can switch vehicles, switch guards, and we are in a caravan of three vehicles. We have armed escorts in the front, I'm in the middle uh, with my colleague and the security advisor, and then we have armed escorts behind us. Um, we make it to the south office, and I do my training, it's very uneventful. And then we get back into the vehicles around three o'clock in the afternoon. 
um, to cross back over the Green Line into the safer part, the northern part of Galkayo. Uh, we take the same route and we drive for about 10 minutes and um, somebody all of a sudden just pulls like really quickly up and cuts us off on the right in another SUV and splashes mud up all over the windshield and all over the windows. And I'm thinking, wow, you know, that's a really rude way to drive. Um, but it is Somalia after all, so it's, it's a bit crazy. And um, I don't think much about it until all, all of a sudden I hear all this shouting and this screaming in Somali. And I see uh, men start to circle the, the vehicle and then they start banging their AK-47s into the windshield and into the windows. And then the passenger door flies open and there's a man standing there and he's screaming. Um, and he's holding an AK-47 to my head and he pulls uh, the security advisor out of the car and he climbs in and then another uh, Somali man uh, who's armed heavily gets into the back and then he starts screaming at the driver to drive, drive, drive as fast as you can. So we take off and I'm holding on to, uh, to the roof of the vehicle because I'm afraid actually that we're going to flip over in the car we're, we're driving like he's driving like a madman out of, out into the middle of the desert and um, I don't realize at that point what exactly is happening um, other than the fact that I know I have two thoughts my first thought is um, this is really bad whatever's happening this is really bad and the second thought is however this plays out my life is changed forever from this moment on. The life that I knew before, all my gallivanting in the desert and all the things that I've been doing, it's changed forever. And so maybe 30 minutes go by and my colleague turns around and he looks at me and I say, what's happening? And he just looks me right in the eye and he says, we're being kidnapped. And all my hopes that maybe we were just being carjacked and we would be dropped off on the side of the road and allowed to walk back into town vanish. And that starts 93 days of absolute uh, torture and terror out in the desert. Yeah, and we, as a family, we, we found out about uh, that uh, Jess was kidnapped about 30 minutes into the kidnapping. And uh, I got a phone call from, from Jess' organization who said that she's been kidnapped. We don't know by whom. We don't know where she is. We don't know much. We just know that she's been kidnapped. And um, I shortly after that called Jess' dad to, to inform her family here in the U.S. And um, yeah, it was, as you can imagine, a quite tough call to make uh, to say that the worst of the worst kind of has happened. Well, she, as far as we know, she's still alive, but we have no idea where she is, and we have no idea what they're doing to her. In this area, there is an Al-Qaeda-linked group called Al-Shabaab that is very present, that actually kind of on the map, if you would say so, that they, they, they have the, the control over the area. So initially, we think that Al-Shabaab might very well be the ones behind the kidnapping, and um, my initial reaction is uh, to go after her, to, to do something. And shortly after, I get a few phone calls from, um, from people that I know with quite a lot of military experience, and uh, they, they also want to go in after Jess. But um, shortly after that, I get a phone call from uh, FBI, and uh, Matt, the agent, he tells me that whatever you do, don't do anything that you feel like doing. You have to step back and let the authorities deal with this. And uh, I think that call probably saved my life at least. And, uh, and uh, I just had to trust that the FBI would do what they promised to do. And uh, they really did. So as um, hours <clears throat> passed uh, into the initial abduction. We stopped in the middle of the desert and we would change personnel. Um, 
a heavily armed, wearing chains of ammunition, carrying machine guns, AK-47s. They made us uh, switch different vehicles and, and so on, and it continued like this <clears throat> for hours. And at one point, I'm sitting, um, I'm sitting there in the middle, just you know, wondering how all of this is going to play out. And I hear a very high-pitched voice behind me, and I think, that's strange, there's a woman in the back of the car. Um, I can't imagine that they would have a woman as part of the abduction. And I turn around to see, and um, behind me is a small child, and he's um, holding an AK, and he's wearing chains of ammunition. And he just looks at me, um, and I think that the irony of why I came to Africa in the first place um, to work with kids and, and child soldiers and, and now here I am being actually kidnapped by one and that's something that um, followed me through the whole the whole experience because this particular child um, he I came to know his name was uh, Abdullahi he um, had already killed three people um, and he was only about 11 years old and he had a particular interest in terrorizing me throughout the whole ordeal. I think he was probably trying to prove himself as a man amongst men, um, but he was also the scariest of the pirates, if you will, because um, because he was so young, he didn't understand the whole concept of cause and effect, that if he, the gun that he was holding to my head or the knife that he was holding to my throat, um, if he, chose to follow through on those actions, then there would be negative consequences in that they wouldn't get the money that they were asking for. And so um, there were so many nights when he was there that I wasn't sure if I was going to wake up in the morning because I didn't know what he was capable of doing. And that was something that followed me through um, those 93 days that was particularly terrifying. Um, it was about a week um, into the uh, kidnapping before we were able to make a phone call to um, our organization. Um, we tried to contact our families, but all the numbers had been changed and switched, um, which I later found out was a strategy used um, during kidnapping um, cases. But I, I didn't know I didn't know that then on that side of things, um, and so they uh, finally told us. Uh, the, the pirates that they were starting the negotiation process at $45 million. And all my colleague and I could say and try to explain is that, you know, we're just two aid workers. We're humanitarian aid workers. We don't make a lot of money. Our families don't make a lot of money. You're never going to get $45 million from us. And they just could not understand that concept. Um, Later, it went down to $18 million, but that was after being marched into the desert with the militia or the pirate leader. And he sat us down under a tree, and he wrote down 18 million and then seven, and said that if he didn't get $18 million in seven days, then he was going to cut off our heads. And so, <clears throat> as you can imagine, um, I think the title of this book, Impossible Odds, is the most perfect title because I was facing the most impossible situation that I have ever known because where would my family come up with $18 million in seven days? And you could think, oh, maybe they weren't serious, but how am I supposed to know? How do any of us know um, as I'm sitting there under a tree with a madman? And so, um, there are so many, <clears throat> so many coping mechanisms that I had to um, employ and so many uh, things that I had to think about in, in terms of, is my life going to end? You know, is this really how it's all going to, to, to end and how it's going to be over? And thinking about Eric and thinking about my dad and, you know, my brother and my sister and my friends. And so, um, this began a process of just trying to survive, um, trying to survive mentally and trying to survive emotionally as well as trying to survive physically. Um, and then I knew that I had a job to do, but I also knew on the other side that Eric and my family had a job to do and they had to survive as well. Yeah, and 
As a family, we couldn't do much. We couldn't go in after these people. We couldn't come up with $18 million. And even if we would have had $18 million or whatever amount they would have asked for, uh, the strategy when it comes to kidnappings is that you cannot just go ahead and pay whatever they want from the beginning. You kind of have to deal with it just like more or less when you buy a house or so, that you, you start very high and you, you kind of come in with a low offer and then you meet somewhere down the line. You, you reach a point where their expenses are higher than, than what they can get out from you to continue doing it for weeks and, and so on. So we knew that this is going to take time. It's not going to be over in two or three days. People around us kept on saying that, well, this can be over in, in a week, it can be over in two weeks. But I think instinctively we knew that, um, that it's going to take quite some time. And um, what we... Uh, we're facing was that uh, that these people they they wanted anything that could be seen as yeah they, they wanted everything from us they they want your money they want your life they want to have control over you and uh, so we had a family communicator set up someone that uh, spoke on behalf of the both families of Jess family and uh, uh, her colleagues family so he was more or less on a daily contact with the pirates after they had may after they came back to us after about six days into the kidnapping. Those first six days, we had no idea where she was. We had no idea who held her. We had no idea if she was alive. We complete darkness. We just knew that the security officer that that um, was responsible for just on the ground, he was actually the one behind the operation. And uh, he had more or less sold Jess and her colleague for, for uh, according to rumors, about $100,000. So with that little information, we just had to trust that the FBI would do what they promised to do, which was that they could potentially, it could be a military attack if Jess' health would be so bad that they thought that she would die or that um, her life was in danger more than just being kidnapped. And now I'm thinking, <laughs> no, but more or less that, that the, the situation had to be so extreme that, that uh, the, there, were no, there was no discussion to be held with the, the, the kidnappers. So um, with that information, we as a family felt a bit relieved. We knew that, okay, well, we're not completely alone. There is someone back there watching over these negotiations because Jess' organization set up also a crisis management team and they were the ones that uh, kind of had the daily, day-to-day -day, uh, contact with our family communicator and also then with the pirates. And as Eric had said, one of the, um, <clears throat> one of the signals for um, uh, taking matters into their own hands in terms of the FBI and the uh, authorities was if my health was declining. Um, and certainly it was, as you can imagine, I was the only woman um, surrounded from by nine to 26 men at all times. Uh, we were held outside. We were never taken into any kind of structure or house. Um, and they moved us around 40 to 50 times. Sometimes we would sleep somewhere at night and then be taken to two or three different locations during the day. Um, we never knew where we were going. We never knew where we were going to end up. Uh, we never knew when we were going to move. Sometimes we'd move twice in the middle of the night. We didn't know who we were running from or what we were supposed to be afraid of. Um, I was not given clean water uh, to wash with. It was always mixed with diesel. They used the same containers to transport diesel for the vehicles that they gave us to wash with every couple of days. Um, toilet paper was definitely an issue. They didn't understand culturally and they didn't understand my needs as a woman. So um, as a result, I ended up with a terrible urinary tract infection. Um, and then to make matters worse, they withheld medication from me or antibiotics as a, a negotiation tactic. Um, always when negotiations weren't going well, um, our people were not offering enough money. They would shout at us, small money, small money, whereas big money 
and then they would take something away. So um, medication was not something I was given. Therefore, I felt like my urinary tract infection was turning into um, a kidney infection. And it was um, January 16th, my last proof of life call that I made um, to our people or our family uh, communicator. And I told her, um, I don't think I'm gonna make it. I, th I think I'm gonna die out here in the desert unless you do something. And so um, because of that message being passed on to Eric, um, he was able to communicate that to the right people. Yeah, so in a meeting with uh, the crisis management team and the FBI on the 18th, I, I had understood that from the symptoms that Jess told on, on the phone that uh, she's not going to make it. Uh, so I went to her doctor and told him that, okay, well, this is what we're facing. And he said, well, you, you get her out or she's going to be dead. Uh, there's no, there's no other solution. Uh, you just need to get her out. And um, until that moment, we as a family had been very afraid of a military rescue, both for uh, that there can be a stray bullet that can kill Jess or her colleague, and also the guys that would go in after her. They could also be in danger. And we knew that um, Jess couldn't live with the fact that if someone w was going in after her, helping her, that he or she, for that matter, would be uh, killed or injured. But at that point, we felt like we at least have to notify the authorities that we think that the time has come. So uh, I went to a meeting on the 18th, and uh, there were two FBI agents there, and I told them that, well, this is the time, you know, we, we She's going to die if uh, nothing happens. And um, it was like in a movie. They, they kind of looked at each other and uh, then disappeared. And um, from that moment on, I, I had a feeling that maybe something will happen. I at least knew that if it will ever happen, it's going to be in a few days. So I. I guess it was January 24th. Um, <clears throat> I'd been keeping pretty good track of, of the days and, and the date, um, but I was starting to starting to lose hope that we were going to get out anytime soon. And I had made a deal with my colleague that I would stop keeping track at 100 days. So we were at 93. So I had seven days to go before I stopped counting. Um, and it was a night just like any other night that we'd been out there we moved our mats from under the trees where we spent the days and then we moved them out into the open they always wanted us to sleep out under open sky during the night i never really understood that and no matter how many people i asked for an explanation i still never understood why we slept out in the open um, but we were out in the open and um, i woke up very early in the morning it was still very very dark out um, because I needed to go out and use the bathroom due to my infection. And what, uh, if we had to go uh, to the bathroom, what we had to do was stand up on our mats and say toilet and wait to be acknowledged or grunted at so we could leave our mat and go. Um, tonight, no one grunted or acknowledged me. And so I said toilet again and again and again. And everybody was completely passed out. They'd had goat around 5 o'clock that afternoon, and they'd been chewing their cot, and they were just completely, you know, passed out, full tummies and sleeping soundly. And so I went to the closest bush I could find, and I took my flashlight, and I flashed it back and forth the whole time to make sure that they knew I was out there because I was so worried that they thought I was trying to escape and what they would do to me if they thought that I was trying to escape. And so um, I come back to my mat, and I hear this like, scratching noise like this in the grass, and I think, Ugh, it's these beetles that come out every night and they're very, very large and they get into your mat and into your blankets and into your hair and they were so disgusting. And um, I'm up trying to fight them, you know, but I can't find them anywhere. Um, and I just constant scratching, 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 and I can't find them anywhere. And so I finally give up and lay back down um, and think I need, you know, I need to sleep. And um, I cover my face with my blanket, and then all of a sudden I hear um, 
one of the pirates who's laying closest to me jump up really fast and I hear him whisper like in a very terrified uh, way like whisper scream and he's calling for the other guys to wake up wake up and I pull the blanket down from away away from my face and I see this look of just terror over his face and he's got his AK pointed and and then all of a sudden the whole night just erupts into massive gunfire and I cover myself again and I try to get as low to the ground as I possibly can and I'm just laying there and I'm praying and I'm I'm thinking we're gonna be kidnapped again by another group maybe this finally is al-shabaab and i don't have the strength to endure this anymore i am not going to make it out of this alive i am not going to survive this ordeal i don't know what this group is going to do to me i don't know what they're going to do with me i just i can't do this anymore and I'm laying there and I'm, I'm just waiting for whatever's going to come next. And all of a sudden I feel all these hands all over me and I start to fight back. And then I hear someone say my name. And it's a man's voice and he says, Jessica. Um, and I think, okay, you know, how do they know my name? He says, Jessica, we're the American military. We're here to save you. We're here to take you home. And they pull the blanket down from my face and I can't see anything. It's just black, it's black sky, it's black masks. And all I can say over and over again is you're American? How, how can there be Americans out here? I'm not the only one, I'm not alone. And they ask me where my shoes are and I can't I'm just so in so much shock, I can't figure out where my shoes are. And so he scoops me up, one of them, and he throws me over his shoulder, and then he just takes off running. And he takes me to a place of safety. And he sets me down, and my first question, of course, is where is my colleague? Is he, did he make it? And he's there, um, and he's safe. And they give me medicine, and they give me food, and they give me water, and, um, they're not sure that the premises are completely safe, and so they all get around and form a ring around us. And then they tell me to lie down on the ground, and then three of them lie down on top of me to protect me and make a human shield on top of me. And we lie like that until the helicopters come in, and um, they are so chivalrous and so kind, and no one has been kind to me for 93 days, so I don't even know how to handle it. And so they're trying to guide me to the helicopters, but I think I've made it this long. I'm going to get to those helicopters myself, and so I just take off running through the shrub, and I throw myself onto the helicopter, and I crawl on my belly all the way to the other side, and I press myself up against the wall, and then I think I finally start breathing um, once we get several hundreds of feet up into the air and I'm sitting there and as you can imagine I mean it really is just like a movie it's all these colors and all these people and and I'm here in the middle of this desert and I think I survived I survived Go Navy. <laughs> absolutely yeah and I have no idea that this is going on I uh, had uh, I wake up that morning feeling that you know kind of hopelessness because I uh, I start to think that okay well it's not going to happen and uh, the first news that hits me from reading about news about Somalia that morning is that uh, another pirate gang that they've chopped off the arm or uh, hand of uh, one of their hostages and sent to the family and and I'm just thinking like okay well so this is what to expect and uh, then half an hour later I get a phone call and I see that it's an Nairobi number I'm at the moment I'm in in Somaliland uh, <coughs> northwestern Somalia and um, and I can see that it is from the, the FBI's liaison Matt and um, I just think that 641 in the morning either it's good news or bad news and I take a deep breath and just answers and and he says that well you know 
she's been rescued. We, uh, she's in safety. She's in on her way to Djibouti. And uh, I don't think I can explain the, the, the joy that you feel, the happiness that you feel. I, I just, this is not a kind of a view that I want to give you, but I was uh, half naked and just <laughs> running around, you know, jumping, screaming for, for a good half an hour, trying to call Jess' dad and, and her family. And, uh, and he had actually already heard the news from, from someone else. And uh, that someone else was President Obama <laughs> so. that uh, called my dad um, after the State of the Union address, I later found out, um, to let him know um, as one dad to another that his daughter was safe and that she was on her way home. And um, so we flew, um, uh, we transferred from the, the helicopter um, to a plane and when I was on the plane um, one of the individuals on the plane comes over to me and he hands me a folded American flag and he just says very simply, welcome home. And that was, that was, that was it. Yeah. So we met a few days later on, uh, or two days later actually. Uh, we had a five minutes phone call that same morning. And Jessica uh, took part in a program called the Hostage Reintegration Program. And it's the Department of Defense, and uh, these guys really knew what they were doing. They, uh, it was of the essence that um, that the hostage or the the victim that uh, she doesn't have a lot of contact <coughs> with the family directly because it can just be too much. So we had five minutes phone call that same day, and uh, yeah, you know you you haven't talked for more than well we had five minutes talk halfway into the kidnapping, but otherwise you have no idea what she's gone through, and there's just so many questions. But um, finally we meet two days later in, in Italy at a uh, Navy base there, an American Navy base, and uh, we're just give, being given one hour then to meet, and uh, that was the right decision, because, uh, yeah, it's just, you can imagine it's almost like someone has yeah, been taken away or almost dead and then they're brought back to life and there you have that person in front of you. That was amazing. Just amazing. I don't cry easily and I'm like for me. <laughs> Right away. God bless America, and we're so happy you're safe. And now we will have some question and answers, and just raise your hand, and I'll call on you and stand up and have a question for either. This gentleman first. Have you, uh, do you know who saved you? Do you know the people? No, I don't know. know. Nope, I don't know. That's the nature of it, I think. Um, just completely anonymous, and then they just disappeared. Are you allowed to write to them, or do they, do they write? I don't, I, have, mm -hmm. I don't know anything. Yes, sir. After you were there for a few days, did you develop any rituals, or was there a prayer you said every night, or was there a conversation you had with your husband in your mind? What, what activities sort of sustained you? There, there were, were a lot of conversations. Um, probably most importantly, at, at night, um, I had just lost my mom about a year uh, before the kidnapping happened, and um, so I had a lot of conversations with her. Actually, at night, um, there are two stars that come out simultaneously every night. Um, the first stars, and I didn't know that until I was out there and looking at them. And um, so I named one for my mom, and I, um, I just talked to her, and um, you know. I talked to her about what I was going through. I talked to her about everything, and that actually that particular night, I I was having my conversation with her, and I said, um, uh, "This is the night of the rescue. Can you please tell God that we need some help? Like, we need to get out of here." And so um, it was definitely an answer to prayer. Yes, sir, over there. I was amazed by the metaphor. 
one moment you say uh, was, your mouth was so dry it felt the dryness of the sand moved around you. Another time you said um, your body was half ice and half fire. Mm. It's like every time I come to the word like, I'm like waiting to see what's going to come next. I'm never disappointed. Um, are you just a very good writer? Or <laughs> <laughs> you know, I have to. Do you, you want to oh. stand up and yeah. I said I was amazed by the metaphors in her book. Every time I come to the word like, I'm waiting to see what's going to come next. I'm never disappointed. At one point she said that her mouth was as dry as the sand dunes around her. Uh, once she said her body was like half ice and half fire. And I'm just asking her whether she thinks she's a really good writer or how to come up with all this. Um, well, I would have to say, generally, I think I am a very descriptive person. Um, however, we had the wonderful fortune of working with a ghostwriter, Anthony Flacco, and he is phenomenally talented. And he was able to take those descriptions when, you know, I would say that I did, I felt like half of me was on fire and half of me was on ice, or, you know, he was able to work those into um, what we really feel is a beautifully written story. And, and so I think it was a contribution on all, all three of our parts to put, put it together. So I will pass that along to him. Yes, over here. Um, let's, well, I got one, when I was taken, I was actually wearing a Somali dira, which is a traditional dress, because that's what I would wear um, when I was out in the field. And then they brought me another dira um, a couple days into the kidnapping. Um, but that was it for about two months. I had two dresses, basically, and underwear was a real issue. They did not understand that I needed women's underwear. I had what I was wearing, and then somebody stole it about a week into the whole thing when I was trying to wash them. And so they brought me men's athletic shorts <laughs> to wear, um, which was very uncomfortable for me. But they just didn't, I don't know if they didn't, they just didn't understand or they didn't care or a mixture of both. Um, keeping clean was such a challenge. Oh, and you know, you adapt, you know, as time goes on. But I mean, my hair was always um, slick because it had diesel in it from the water that they would give me to wash my hair with. Um, and you know, sometimes they only bathed it looked like once every two weeks or something like that. So me needing to wash every couple of days when water was um, not plentiful, um, it was it was definitely a problem. They brought me a toothbrush. They did. They brought me a toothbrush. <laughs> story before so when they told you that you can talk to your wife for only five minutes and then only see her for an hour did you push back on that I have a hard time thinking after this whole ordeal that I wouldn't just say are you kidding me no you know Strangely enough, I didn't I, I in one way I, of course I wanted all the time that I could be given but they had taken her out you know these guys had taken her out, and I just felt like they, they know what they're doing. Uh, I just have to trust them, and, and I'm very happy that, that I didn't. But I think it was, I had the, the fortunate to, to meet Jess after two days, but uh, Jess' family had to wait a few more days, and I think they probably had a tougher time than I did. Yes? Could the two of you talk a bit about the impact of the experiences on your professional as well as personal lives? Um, I think uh, professionally um, uh, it's been more difficult for me. Um, I th we have agreed, I think, and, and still plan to, to continue humanitarian efforts and, and work in the D.C. area um, if opportunities arise. Um, uh, two months after the kidnapping or after the, the rescue, we did return back to Nairobi and stayed in Kenya for about 10 months. Um, but it became difficult for me to be in that environment and to return back to work with the same organization that I was with. Um, I tried, but it was it was just it was too much. And so um, Eric continued on working um, in Somalia, actually, and he's still working on that portfolio now. And so um, 
you know, we're just uh, trying to see what else is out there. And um, Africa is always going to be a part of us um, on an emotional level and a professional level. And so whatever we can do to continue working in that capacity, uh, maybe from a bit safer location uh, for a time, I think is, is our goal right now. Yeah, and I think on a personal level, it definitely has changed a lot. I think that uh, we we have we were fortunate enough to to have good support around us, which is uh, essential, both from family, friends, uh, authorities, you name it. Mm -hmm. And and I think that we've been able to to actually grow closer together, rather than see this as something that could potentially. Uh, be a dividing factor for for many people, and um, and also for us as a family, the greater family, not just Jess and myself, but our our respective families and so on. I think we have been able to to use this experience in a in a how can I put it? I don't want to put positive in, <laughs> but uh, but uh, I think we've we've grown closer as a big family. Um, I think initially on upon my return um, making decisions was very difficult for me um, because you know I mean all control was taken away from me all decision making was taken away from me I was just ordered to do this and that's what I had to do my life depended on it and so um, you know asking me if I wanted cornflakes for breakfast was too much for me to handle. Um, and I find that I still have a really hard time making decisions um, about those little things. Um, it took me months uh, to get to the point where I could make a, um, I could pay a bill online. I remember the first time I was actually able to do that, I paid a credit card bill online and I felt such victory, but it literally took me like six months before I was able to do something like that just because um, I think the amount of concentration that it took um, and having to make choices and I don't know, I, I, there, there's a lot of psychology behind all of it. Um, I think the thing that I deal with the most right now is that my trust in, in in the world has been shattered to a certain extent. Um, you know, uh, you don't expect something like this to ever happen to you, you know. Um, and so little by little, I'm building it back up again. And it's amazing how um, you're taken care of by meeting so many lovely, kind, generous people helping you piece everything back together. Um, I don't know where I would be without Eric. I don't know where I would be without my dad and, and my, my brother and my sister and my friends. Um, and then uh, eight months ago, we had um, a baby boy to help us put everything uh, back together. And um, the night of the abduction, when I thought I was, I thought that this was the end, I thought I was going to be executed the re repeating thought that kept coming to me was I never even got to be a mother. I put everything on hold to work and I never, I never even, I'm 32 and I never got to have the chance to have a child. And um, I love that saying by Elizabeth Barrett Browning that God's gifts put ba man's best dreams to shame. And so eight months ago we had a baby boy, August. And so, yeah, we're, we're, we're making progress, you could say. Anybody else? Yes. What do you tell young aid workers who are interested in Go. Go, absolutely. Make sure you're well informed. <laughs> uh, make sure you take security uh, seriously. Um, make sure you assess the risks and you, whatever, you know, you do sign up for certain inherent risks for sure. Um, but this doesn't ever stop either one of us from feeling like there's work to be done in a place like Africa. I mean, you know, there's, it proves that there's just so much more work to be done. So, absolutely. Yes. I just, I just want to say that I read the book, it was great, especially the inside voice that comes out and the themes that 
thievery, unfortunately, throughout mm. the whole captivity. Question I had about your coping, which you mentioned earlier. Uh, in the book, you said you had a small black bag. Some, sometimes you had to improvise and eating tuna fish or other. Were you able to keep anything on your person uh, from the beginning of captivity to the end? I, I know you mentioned the pen light. I don't know where that came from. But. They gave that to me. Um, I did. I kept that black bag, um, and I have it actually um, from the time that they made me get out of the car and go into the desert um, that night that we were abducted. Um, I asked them if I could go and get my medicine. I have a thyroid condition and I, I knew, ugh, I don't know why it seemed futile, but I just asked them and they did, they let me take the bag. And um, so I kept that the entire time. Um, unfortunately, they kept stealing things out of it as you know time went by, but yeah, I, it's amazing. I kind of felt like, MacGyver or something, you know, like <laughs> I had a bobby pin and I had a tampon and so I could use the tampon applicator to eat tuna fish and and then um, the bobby pin you, you could use to cut the tops of plastic bottles off of. I mean, it's amazing, like when you have a lot of time and, you know, very little resources, what you can come up with. So, um, yeah, but that bag will be with me forever. Are these pirates often successful in getting that kind of money out of uh, families? Yeah, they Or does the money come from places other than families? Yeah, usually. I mean, uh, usually what would happen is that a ship is being taken and then it, then it's not the families, then it would be the, the yeah, the big shipments, so to say, or shipments, the, the, yeah, the ones who own whatever ship it is. And uh, these can go up to tens of millions. It's not normal, but... Uh, Usually it is uh, how it works is that, uh, let's say, three, four million dollar for, for a ship and uh, they will send in the money and um, via a chopper or something, drop it somewhere and then you just have to hope that they will release the boat and, uh, and the hostages on board. There has been a few cases uh, or have been a few cases actually with uh, first a British couple and a Danish family and um, and then later on also a British woman where the families have been able to come up with the money. And they never got it back? No. And um, they, um, these are bad people, really, really bad people. They, uh, they have no sense of ethics or morale. And I want to, I think both of us want to make the, the yeah, it has to be clear that these are bandits just like we have probably here in the US and in Sweden where I come from. They're not Somalis. They're, um, they're just bad people. Yes, sir. They well, are they, are, they are Somalis, sorry, but, but they're not, uh, <laughs> they're Somali gangsters. They're not just Somalis. Okay. Sorry. I haven't. I haven't actually. Um, I would definitely welcome the opportunity, but I think, um, <clears throat> as you can imagine, it's traumatic for everybody in, in different ways, and, and so everybody kind of just needs to take their own path. Yes. My name is Ralph Signal. <clears throat> as a correspondent for the German radio mm -hmm. here in Washington, D.C., I was based for some years in Nairobi also. Mm -hmm. Um, what I'm thinking about is the relationship to your colleague. He was with you all the time. Could you talk to him during the day? Could you make jokes? Could you could you play whatever? I don't think you could play chess with him, but we play checkers actually okay. <laughs> in the dirt. Um, we were together for part of the time, and then we were separated a large part of the time. And um, the times of separation were most difficult um, because you were in solitary confinement essentially so um, just sitting isolated and there were times when they took him away um, and I didn't know if he was still alive or not um, so uh, yeah I, I think any hostage would say that it's definitely better to be held with somebody else because you can yeah talk and like you said you know share stories and um, he'd had a very interesting life and and so he definitely tried to entertain me as much as he could um, so but uh, yeah it was difficult anybody else one more <laughs> Go ahead. 
curious if you talk a little bit about the process of writing the book and then coming to talk to audiences like this. Is it, is it difficult to recount these things over and over again, or does it help in some way to, to talk to <coughs> I think both, actually. Um, I find that when I get to s some parts, and it's always a different part, so I can't predict that I've become emotional. I do feel uh, quite emotional when I talk about some parts. Um, uh, but I do believe that it is very cathartic to, to recount it and to share, um, share the story. And um, the process of writing the book was really interesting because Eric and I were back in Nairobi. Um, and then Anthony, who wrote the book with us, was in Seattle. And so we did all of it over Skype. So we spent hundreds of hours on Skype. Um, and so it, it's, you know, been a new process for us, but definitely a very positive experience. And um, I think we just feel really, really fortunate, you know, that um, we're here and we're together and, and we have the opportunity to share this and um, people are interested and, and want to hear what happened. There are just so many people to thank um, and that was the reason for writing the book in the first place is just to say thank you, you know, uh, to the different agencies, the FBI, um, the SEALs, the President, family and friends who prayed for us nonstop. So. And also I would just like to add there that when, when Jess came out, you know, there, there are so many 93 days, so many things happen during these 93 days that uh, both for Jess, of course, living there and trying to survive and, and also on the outside. So it was really good to sit down, to get a chance to actually sit down for hundreds of hours and recounting what has been going on and during this whole time and I don't think we would ever get to know a lot of the, the things that we actually have talked about uh, because of course a lot of things are not also they're not mentioned in the book I mean and uh, and I think that has been a fantastic opportunity for us actually uh, to get to write this book yes ma'am what, what happened to your captors when you were rescued um, the men on the ground yeah. they, they died Okay, well, yes. The security was penetrated, your security was had what percentage? They were all in on it? The the team when you were original the uh, your security when you were abducted. <coughs> One of them was or do you know? We can speculate, um, yeah, the so how it works is that you have a security liaison officer on the ground and uh, and this person is more or less responsible for for the whole security team. So he had most likely, this is what we think, <laughs> he had most likely chosen his boys this day and uh, he knew that they were with him and uh, they would get some share of the deal at the end of the day. Well, we want to thank you so much, Jessica and Eric, for coming <laughs> and sharing amazing story of survival with us and we would like to present you each with a national press club oh. mug mm -hmm. very nice thank with you our man. best wishes wow and jessica and eric will be signing their book right here thank you so we are done and make a line and get your book signed <laughs> <laughs> thank you